Well, good morning, everybody. It's now two minutes past the hour, so I think we're going to kick off uh, today's webinar where we're going to look at a little bit of the perspectives of uh, marketing automation and, and how we see this in, uh, in 2014. Uh, my name is uh, Lasse Christensen. I'm one of the owners of the company called Increase. And uh, we've uh, decided to have this uh, webinar in English and our webinar series in general will going forward be in uh, in English to, due to the fact that we have uh, more and more of our existing and international clients that uh, are willing to uh, or interested in joining these webinars. So uh, we're going to do all of our webinars uh, going forward in uh, in English. So I um, hope that's uh, okay with you. For those of you I, I can see from the, the attendances uh, for this webinar that there are some people that's been on our webinars before also, which is super uh, so I hope you're okay with uh, listening to uh, my voice in uh, in English this time um, this uh, webinar just for information is also uh, being recorded so uh, if you wanna uh, view it uh, once again or you might think that there are other people that uh, find this uh, relevant and interesting um, uh, you'll get a link to the actual uh, recording um, uh, during tomorrow or later today when uh, when our marketing uh, guys has um, has consolidated that so um, just a short agenda while we kick this off. Um, uh, so the purpose of this webinar is just to give uh, sort of a perspective of how we see the arena of marketing automation developing in uh, 2014. And the reason we set up this webinar, which is a little bit different agenda from what we usually uh, focus on, uh, which you know usually is, is more of the tactical or, or decision-making elements of, of marketing automation. Uh, so, so the reason we set up this um, this webinar and, and this uh, uh, topic is actually because a lot of our customers have been asking us about what's going on in the marketing or automation market with all of the consolidations and vendors buying each other and is customers adopting this uh, this uh, software and this technology or is it is it moving forward at all? So we thought the uh, you know, start of start of the new year and uh, everybody is uh, making assumptions on where uh, and what will happen in in the coming year. So we thought we'll uh, jump onto that trend and uh, give kind of our perspective uh, on uh, on this specific market. So um, I hope you all uh, are aware that we specialize in marketing automation, which means that uh, we're not going to give you the uh, big uh, social is the new uh, nice thing and everybody should be going that way sort of pitch. We're going to be focusing on marketing automation and uh, and what uh, what's going on in this specific uh, market and how we see that developing. I'm just going to spend uh, one or two slides on uh, on who we are so everybody understands uh, where we're coming from. Then I'm going to give you an update, which is the marketing automation market on um, on where we are right now in the development uh, process of uh, of this market and all of the consolidations that's uh, going on. And I'm going to give you a view of the four main things we see happening in 2014 um, with uh, with uh, automation in uh, in general. And also, um, just for for this sort of webinar, which is not that much of a you know product or tactical or best practice presentation, I'd really love to have some interactions with you during the webinar. So feel free to ask questions in the chat window. Um, if you have anything that you would like to elaborate on, or you have comments to some of the stuff that uh, that we're seeing, maybe you see it differently, or maybe you just want to acknowledge that uh, I'm spot on actually. <laughs> Um, so uh, feel free to interact while we uh, we have this. I have the chat window open next to me, so um, I can uh, comment uh, every time we have um, a question uh, coming up. And if no questions, it's also fine. We'll just uh, uh, skip through the slides and uh, and give you our view of how how this market is uh, is developing. So I hope that kind of fits your expectations. Um, at least that's what we plan for now. Uh, so uh, let's uh, kick it off. Um, we have a good uh, good turnout actually today. Fifty some people uh, from what is this? Six different countries actually. So I think that's uh, really super. And I can see our webinars um, that we have twice uh, every month is uh, it's becoming more and more international. So I'm I'm very uh, very pleased with uh, with that also. So uh, as I said before, just uh, uh, the two slides actually on on who we are. So everybody has sort of a sense of where it is that we're coming from. Now, the ones that the uh, Noahs might uh, uh, you know, have seen this slide before, but uh, just want to uh, give everybody a, a, a clear picture of, uh, of who we are. So we're actually the highest certified marketing automation partner in the Nordics. We are gold partner certified from, uh, from Oracle. We specialize in Oracle's uh, automation platform called uh, Eloqua. Um, 
we have uh, 23 resources and we do nothing else than uh, work with marketing automation. And these resources cover everything from uh, strategic uh, advisory around uh, marketing automation, tactical uh, stuff of how do we actually get this solution to be implemented and work, etc. And also the operational uh, stuff of uh, integrations and setting up templates and uh, getting the platform actually to bring value to uh, to the customers we uh, we have. The last two years we've been awarded uh, in the top two partners in Europe by uh, Oracle and um, we've been uh, lucky enough to get a number of awards from them uh, chosen as the strategic partner of uh, of the Nordics for Oracle. Uh, also uh, as I said before we've chosen as, as the second best uh, partner in Europe uh, for the last two years and also just last week, maybe some of you saw that from my newsletter, we were very pleased to uh, to win an award uh, for the uh, specialized cloud partner uh, in Denmark, which we were awarded the best. So um, very pleased with uh, with that. We invest quite a lot of resources in uh, in competences and uh, and in ensure that we're upfront on what happens happening on the technology arena. One of the reasons for that is that this market is really developing very very fast and just as an example yesterday we had all of the company um, locked out uh, not locked out that sounds a little bit strange but uh, focused on uh, certification so we had 25 people yesterday just uh, doing exams and certifications etc to keep up with the number of uh, resources that uh, that, uh, that we should have um, so um, yeah, so the first question actually came up from Sonia here, who's asking if the Oracle acquisition of responses will affect our business at all. And um, I'm, I'm going to come back to that, uh, Sonia, in in, uh, in a little while, um, because I'm also going to cover some of the other consolidations that's happening on uh, on this market. And uh, and you know, and, and just to comment on it quickly, also, I, I'm not sure I actually have the right answer for that uh, question right now, because uh, you know the the acquisition hasn't even been. Uh, uh, been uh, confirmed yet uh, it's still illegal naturally it's probably going to go through but uh, I think Oracle themselves don't even know what what it's going to mean um, yeah I'm just going to skip this slide it's more of a it's more of a, a show off that we've done implementations in a ton of different countries and have global customers and all of this uh, this nice stuff so uh, enough of uh, who's who um, let's uh, jump into a perspective of the marketing uh, automation uh, market. Um, oh, somebody's telling me that there's no sound on right now. I hope there is. Um, oh, it's okay. So Peter told me uh, we're back online. So, um, so let's uh, focus on the marketing automation market and what's uh, what's happening on uh, on this as um, but as I just uh, said before, this is a market that's growing extremely fast. Actually, uh, both Forrester and Gartner Group have said that this is going to be one of the software categories that's going to grow the fastest the next couple of three years. And if we look back just uh, you know, three, four, five years, and uh, you know, we went to customers and we said marketing automation, and they would say, what in the world are you talking about? What kind of stuff is that? Um, you know, and, and there were only a few kind of known vendors and just just for the last um, 12 months this market has really developed and just the category and, and the wording of marketing automation has been uh, much more recognized from uh, from customers and you know new uh, vendors has entered the market new partners have entered the market but a lot more focus has come in um, into the into this market and if you kind of ask yourself what is it that makes a market uh, software category like marketing automation um, suddenly grow this fast and I, and I think we see three main uh, reasons that this um, that this market is, 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 is really growing and the first of all is, is for those of you that have been on, on our webinar before we, we've talked about quite a number of times uh, the, the kind of fundamental change in the customers buying process from being you know driven from us as a company that sells stuff to uh, customers to being much more self-serviced and naturally much more online so it's really um, a fundamental change of how we uh, interact with our customers and how customers are buying from us. In the old days, you know, we could, uh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Steen asked if you could get a copy of the uh, of the DSS afterwards, and uh, definitely you can get a copy of that. Uh, we'll uh, we'll send that out for you. Um, <coughs> one second. 
yeah, caught on, caught on a little bit of a cough here, so I might go on mute just uh, once in a while. So again, uh, uh, the fundamental change of customers buying process is, is really all about, uh, instead of us trying to sell the customers, we need to try to uh, help them buy from us. So being able to do nurturing and personalized communication and timing our messages correctly. And I think that's also exactly what the customers are expecting today. So it's not uh, anymore something that, oh, it's a nice to have. This is what customers are expecting. Um, you know, we, we know from, from all of our customers and clients we speak to that in general uh, response rates and stuff like that from standard campaigns are, are dropping, right? And you probably see that in your own uh, communication also. And we spend a lot of resources trying to identify how we can improve our, uh, our, um, our response rates. One of the other uh, uh, changes is uh, if you look at the, the sales and marketing organization, I think it is probably, and I know there's marketing people and sales people that's, uh, that's going to kill me after I say this, but if you really look at it, this is probably one of the most ineffective parts of any company's organization. We spend so much money in sales and marketing, and you know, just the mere fact that we can't really document the effect of what marketing is doing. What, what other part of the company would actually allow that, right? So if you were to buy a new ERP platform or a new production facility or whatever it might be, investing millions and millions of, of uh, euros in, uh, in anything like that. Now, the CEO and the board would uh, naturally ask for a, uh, a business case or an ROI that will show how this investment will come back to us. But in sales and marketing, we invest a ton of money, and it's kind of accepted that uh, we can't really document the, um, the, uh, the effect. And if, just to give you a few examples of some of the key figures we can pull out of different uh, reports. Now, um, Forrester says that just about 38% of all cost in a company is related to sales and marketing. So it's a massive investment that's really been, uh, been set off for, for sales and marketing. And also, uh, other reports uh, uh, indicates that uh, uh, just about 6 to 10% of all leads that are generated from marketing will be followed up by sales. The rest will never be followed up. And there's a lot of reasons uh, for that, which we've covered in, uh, in some of our other webinars, uh, the fact that uh, nobody has really defined, uh, only a few companies has defined what is a lead actually. And you know, the, the slide we usually also uh, use about the 12 rounds of boxing between sales and marketing. So go to the sales department and ask them about the quality of leads from sales, or oh, sorry, from marketing. And usually we'll get an answer that says, you know, do you call that a lead just because somebody submitted the form on a website? or they handed over the business card on the event, that's not a lead, sales will say, right? Also, uh, kind of interesting, uh, Fournay Group uh, made a research, it's actually from uh, 2011, it was refreshed in, uh, in 12 also, where they say that 80% of the 600 CEOs that was interviewed in this report, 88% of them said that they believe that sales and marketing can be more effective, right? And at the same time, they also, 75% of them actually said that they think the key for generating growth is sales and marketing. So it's actually an area that, uh, that has a lot of attention from the, from the CEO. And, and also, if you look at some of the, the other numbers on this slide, um, we also have uh, other reports that, that uh, looks into how is the time spent from a sales resource. And usually, um, most of the reports are, are, are kind of aligned on that, and some, some will say 63% and other ones will say 50, et cetera. But in the arena of 50 to 60% of time spent from a salesperson is on customers that is never going to buy anything from you. You know, so we've tried this, uh, all of us that is in sales and marketing, you know, calling out to a customer, uh, trying to set up a meeting with him, and maybe you get the first meeting and, you know, spend time on that, and you come back and you send material and you follow up, and, he, the, you know, the customer will tell you, yeah, call me again in 14 days, and, you keep this going forever and ever, and at some point, you know, the customer says, don't call me, I'll call you. So a lot of resources is being spent on, uh, on customers. And also another interesting report actually uh, says that um, in 2018, now that's, that's just around the corner, we will have 35% less salespeople. The reason for that is that uh, customers will self-service themselves, right? And if you look at the investment from any online shops or uh, any customer that has any form of uh, um, you know, potential of, of having an online shop, uh, everybody's trying to drive uh, business that, that 
direction because cost of sales and you know the customers can service themselves and we can easily um, uh, service the customers. Um, also, I think the the last point of uh, of one of these reports is um, is also interesting because that's sort of a breaking point on whether uh, we as uh, you know marketing automation suppliers or you as uh, as buyers are going to have success with uh, with transforming sales and marketing. And actually, the CEO seventy percent of these uh, CEOs says that marketing lacks the credibility to generate. Um, uh, growth, you know, the credibility from the organization. This is really about uh, you know, marketing has uh, come up uh, to the CEO quite a number of times, right? And we've sing and danced about there's a new website that's going to transform everything. And then it was, you know, social is the new new thing. We need to be everywhere on social. Or then it's, it's mobile. Or you know, the the next thing in in marketing is always uh, our investment plan. And uh, so when, when we go to our CEO and say, you know, the next thing, it's marketing automation, we really need to be on that. That's really one of the breaking points for, for customers uh, that, that really want to transform sales and marketing is are, are you able to really persuade the CEO that this is actually a very good in, uh, investment? So how does all this uh, relate? We spoke a little bit in the beginning of, um, of uh, <coughs> one second. <coughs> Sorry about that. We spoke a little bit uh, in the beginning um, uh, about uh, what we see happening in the marketing in, in general. And I think for all of our customers that, uh, that we meet and speak with, I think you know, customer expectations has changed. It's not something that's going to happen, right? Uh, if you're online anywhere and uh, you know, we expect to receive personalized messages. You know, I, I purchased this product from you. Why are you sending me information about another product? Um, so our, our expectations has fundamentally changed uh, already. And I think some of the numbers that we put up on the slide before, they might not be completely accurate, but I think it's an indication of uh, the fantastic opportunity that lies in optimizing sales and marketing uh, in general. We invest so much money in this area, and if you look at it, as I said in the beginning, this is the only area that has not really had a, a big focus on optimization. Right. Uh, go back um, many, many years. It was uh, uh, TQM projects, and it was lean. And during the financial crisis, uh, you know, how can we improve our cash and production lines and whatever? And I think the the year of uh, 2014 and the next five years or so is really going to be all about sales and marketing. Now, if you look at any of the big vendors, what they're communicating, it's all about customer experience and how we can be customer focused and how we can interlink all our platforms and make those platforms uh, be able to communicate uh, personalized and relevant uh, communication to our customers, supporting them on all of the different channels. So I think really one of the things that's going to be focused, not only for 14 actually, it's something that's going to be uh, the next uh, five, 10 years, is about being customer centric and driving sales and marketing to a totally different uh, uh, level that, that we're at right now because the, the sales models and, and the way we drive marketing for many customers is, um, you know, is, is kind of ancient in, in terms of uh, how the customers actually are expecting us to, um, uh, to deliver messages. So if you look at the, uh, the technology and the consolidation uh, on this part of the platform, And he's back again. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to cough a little bit. So if you look at the technology consolidation, then from, uh, from, from the vendor's perspective, quite a big uh, consolidation has actually happened already. And this uh, kind of covers some of the, the questions that were, that were here earlier about Oracle also buying responses. Um, so this process actually started out with Oracle purchasing uh, Eloqua. And Eloqua was kind of the, the defined market leader of this uh, of this process and and for Oracle it was a, a really strategic investment because you know they have their customer experience cloud and they had the for some years ago bought a marketing platform that really didn't do that uh, that much but buying one of the leaders of the market really completed their customer experience uh, uh, cloud offering and I think if you look at, at the market in general they really have a strong uh, uh, strong positioning not only with the Eloqua uh, platform naturally but also, the latest purchase of Compendium, which is a fantastic uh, content marketing uh, handling uh, platform. They have their social platform, etc. So they kind of started this consolidation wave uh, by purchasing uh, Eloqua. 
Um, not that long after Salesforce actually bought exact targets like Pado, so they also got some technology in. Adobe bought uh, Neolane, and then Oracle, uh, as you asked about before, uh, um, uh, bought uh, Responses. Now, uh, it's set, uh, Oracle's purchase of Responses, as far as I'm informed, it's set to, uh, to, um, um, to, to go through maybe six months from now. So to elaborate on what this is going to mean for our business specifically, it's really difficult to say, I think. But in general, uh, responses is technology, Eloquist technology, Pado is technology, and uh, you know, taking ineffective marketing and uh, supporting that with technology doesn't make it effective. So the big change and the big value comes from you know what what we're focusing a lot on is is the processes and the way we drive sales and marketing. Now we just need some technology to to enable that also, and you need best of breed in that in that sense and um, I think uh, uh, responses bring some value to the marketing cloud of Oracle uh, because they have a, um, a more clean B2C focus um, so I think uh, and this is completely me speculating because I naturally as a company in Denmark have no insight into the strategic uh, uh, evaluations from uh, from Oracle but from my perspective I think they might bring in some technology but from a technology perspective Eloqua is by far the leading uh, technology and platform and the way it's been built and the infrastructure behind it. So I think Responses is going to bring some technology that can be uh, added into the Eloqua platform. And they also bring a brand which is B2C oriented. I think that's some of the stuff that's going to be uh, bringing into um, to, to Oracle's uh, offerings. So again, back to the marketing automation and the technology consolidation. I think uh, all of the CRM vendors are trying to get into this market because they see this is a fantastic market and it's growing uh, rapidly. And also because you know CRM platforms are naturally still an important part of the of the uh, of the sales and marketing technology stack. Um, but uh, I think to to complete that, they really need to have a marketing offering that's uh, interlinked with their CRM system. And I think projects in general, we see them starting up from different uh, areas. Uh, one, some of them might start up from a CRM perspective. You know, I have Oracle, so naturally I'm looking for Eloqua or whatever it might be. But uh, also other players are trying to get into the uh, marketing automation arena because it's a very attractive place to be in terms of growth and uh, profitability, et cetera. And this is uh, some of the classic email service providers like the Apsis and the Danish Globase, MailChimp, B Marketing, whatever they're called, all of them, which is uh, you know standard email marketing that does email marketing fine, but lacks the uh, you know complexity of lead scoring engines and uh, complex nurturing and multi-channel communications from both offline, online, social, mobile, etc. Uh, but it has a perspective from uh, from email uh, communication. I think these guys are also trying to to get into this uh, arena. A lot of them, I think is 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 uh, you know, saying the right words and has the right powerpoints but usually when we dive into the the technology they're quite limited in terms of what actually is needed so i think the market is dividing up into two uh, two areas the uh, the ones that want to be full blown marketing automation um that's one set of customers and then there's the uh, smaller customers which you know don't have a big uh, marketing department or a need neither for a complete marketing automation solution, and there's definitely a space for for the service email service providers, um, uh, you know, in, in their existing customers to add on simple nurturing um, flows and and stuff like that. Also, what we see, and uh, which is also very interesting, uh, is uh, some of the CMS platforms that's entering the automation market, and especially Sitecore has done a very good job of. Uh, of this, and we've we've certified ourselves also on the site called platform. I think it's also a really interesting, uh, uh, interesting technology. But then again, they they come from a different perspective of the CMS platform. So as you can see, there's quite a number of uh, vendors that are trying to you know enter this uh, uh, this this uh, arena of marketing automation. And naturally, <coughs> one second. Yeah, and I'm back again. So naturally, with uh, that number of uh, vendors looking at this and communicating about this, um, is going to push the um, you know the the growth rates of uh, of this market because everybody wants to you know try to push this. Um, so I think 
from that perspective, we see four main tendencies that is um, is happening in um, in this arena. One of them is an actual change of uh, the sales and marketing role. Um, I'm going to cover that in in uh, just a second. Spend some uh, some time on uh, on what we mean with uh, with that specifically. Another thing is uh, big data, and uh, you know, I almost don't dare to say that word because it it's kind of like in the days where green IT was the you know the new thing, and everything was green IT, and then we all got sick and tired of hearing about green IT, and then it was something different. And I think the just the brand of big data is kind of ending up with that. Everybody knows a little bit about it, and you know it's been talked so much about. So I'm going to try to bring this into a marketing perspective, and what does this actually mean? But I think this is some of the stuff that's also going to affect 2014 quite the, quite a lot. Um, also, uh, what we call customer-centric communication. Uh, I think that's some of the stuff that's going to take off in uh, in 2014. And then the last element is we we really see a lot of customers. We have a a huge uh, pipeline of uh, prospects and uh, customers that are in a decision-making process. So I think the year of 2014 is really going to be a year where we see a ton of uh, implementations of, of marketing automation. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that in, in the end of this slide. I think those are the four main tendencies that, that uh, we see in this uh, arena. And let's try to dump into the first one of, uh, of the roles and of marketing automation, uh, sorry, sales and marketing, uh, and the way we see that's actually changing. So let me first introduce you to uh, this little guy. This is uh, this, the uh, very professional uh, looking uh, sales guy here. Um, <coughs> and if you look at the roles of the sales guy, I think it's, it's usually divided up into two main areas, right? We have the actual sales process. And I think uh, this is where the sales guys really love to be because this is all about uh, you know, uh, uh, talking to the customer, the actual buying process, aligning with the customer needs, you know, solution propositions, the big meetings where we come up with our presentations, the negotiations and the contractual elements, you know, this, the buying process where the customer has an actual project, there is a budget associated to it, maybe there is an actual need, we know that this is going to be a purchase. This is where salespeople love to be and I think this is also where they should be spending most of their time, right? And the other part of a salesperson's role, which is uh, we put it down to to the legs because you know it's really about footwork and and running and and keeping a tempo, and that's really about identifying the potential customers and sending out the introduction materials, doing follow up calls, introduction meetings, you know, cold calls, and following up on leads from the CRM, and uh, 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 you know, uh, once in a while updating the uh, CRM platform. Um, updating the CRM platform and uh, and I think if you look at how much time is being spent on prospecting as I said on the uh, slide uh, about the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the the time spent from a sales resource usually it's about you know 40 50 percent of time that's being spent on prospecting it's a huge amount of time and I think for most of the sales reps that are you know more or less uh, experienced um, you know the, the 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 place where they feel most comfortable where they think they bring the most value is the top of this where they can use their head and their skills and everything um, and I think also from a customer perspective this is where they actually bring value but in many uh, organizations you know a lot of time and resources are being spent from sales organizations in this uh, arena um, And if you kind of look at this from an organizational standpoint and a process point of view, I think uh, usually you would see uh, the marketing organization uh, um, handling sort of the first phase of the process, right? Doing the marketing collaterals, the events and the campaigns and the updating of the websites and communicating uh, content on social or whatever it might be. And as I said before, you know, sales would do the prospecting, following up on the lead, the cold calls and you know, making uh, sure that we call back to this guy in 14 days because he's uh, not ready to speak to us now or maybe we should call him in three weeks or three months or whatever it might be. And they also handle uh, all of the uh, the offers and the budgets and negotiations we talked about before. And what we're seeing actually for some of the customers that are um, at the front of this uh, curve is that this um, classical organizational setup is really changing. Um, and it's changing in the sense that marketing is taking over um, 
a much bigger part of the process and the sales process. Um, I've just come back from uh, last week where I was in the U.S. Uh, starting up a new customer. And what was really interesting uh, about this is that they have a big uh, call center of, uh, of uh, 50 people. And these 50 people were not referring to uh, organizational, referring to the sales director. They were referring to the marketing director. Um, and this company is uh, it really a, a, an interesting company because they, they focus very much on how can we optimize the processes in sales and marketing to be more effective. And they found that uh, by moving market, sorry, moving the call centers into marketing really made, made it a smoother process because they are much more aligned in the process. And if you look at this from a broader perspective, what I think will happen in 2014 is that we'll see more and more companies looking at the sales department. And, um, and also, if you think about this in your own uh, in your own company, uh, now maybe you'll be B2C or B2B, but in the companies where you have an actual sales department, then how much of your, the time of your sales resources are actually being spent on uh, prospecting? And if you take that amount of resource and move that into marketing with the actual resources, now that might mean laying off X number of salespeople and giving that budget to marketing, hiring, uh, uh, you know, uh, cold calling uh, resources and investing in marketing automation. I think we're going to see a lot of this happening in the, in the next 12 or 18 months. Um, what we sense from the customers we speak to is that people are aware of this, but it is more of the internal um, you know, power battles on, uh, oh, uh, this is something that sales has always been running. You know, uh, Will this really have effect? It, it's more about the, that uncertain, uncertainty then it is about uh, understanding that we need to change the way sales and marketing is running. Just, just try to calculate the cost of sales. How much money are you actually spending on prospecting? You know, you, what you could do is, uh, is go down to your sales director and ask him if it's okay for you to speak with uh, some of the salespeople and just take three, four salespeople and ask them about uh, their day, how it's structured, how much time are they spending on following up and you know, customers that are not ready and all of this stuff. And then you can just time it up with the, the number of salespeople you have. And you get a very, very interesting um, dialogue with, uh, with, your, uh, with your organization because so much money is spent on prospecting from the salespeople. And the interesting part is also, as I said in the beginning, is that customers are not expecting a sales rep to call them. We know from uh, analysis that just about 63% of a decision has been made before we actually speak to a sales rep. Well, that doesn't matter if it's B2C or B2B. This is uh, uh, calculating the cross markets. So, you know, we serve websites and we download content and we watch webinars like this one, um, you know, and, and we make up our decisions before the sales rep actually comes in. So that big of a, a part of our decision making is actually done without the sales resource being involved, then why is a major part and the biggest part of the complete budget for sales and marketing being spent on sales when this is not what customers actually want to, uh, to be focused on. So I think um, this is, is really some of the stuff that's going to be, um, um, be focusing on. Um, okay, I see a couple of people here saying that they were losing uh, sound once in a while. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, not really sure what I can do about it. Let me just see if I have a bad connection or anything. It should, it should be okay. Hmm. Sorry about that, guys. I hope uh, I hope it's not uh, too much. I actually have a full connection here. Okay, we'll try to... Uh... Okay, I can see Peter is saying here it's when the animations comes in and uh, the sound is uh, dropping out once in a while. Okay. Um... Yeah, I can see that. All right, guys, thanks a lot for uh, for giving me that feedback. I'll uh, I'll uh, make sure the uh, animations uh, stay out, uh, or else not say anything when they're when they're on. Okay, so uh, as I said before, uh, I think 2014 is really going to be a, a time where um, the sales and marketing investments is gonna is gonna switch. I'm not sure if that many customers are actually going to uh, make this switch in 2014. But I think it's going to come, uh, come up as a topic and something that will be discussed. So when we go to the end of 2014, I think we will see restructuring in, in a lot of uh, companies uh, investing more in marketing and less in, uh, 
less in sales, moving funds and budgets for the 2015 uh, uh, plan uh, from sales into uh, to the marketing department. But also with that, dear marketing people, follows the responsibility of ensuring that the sales then gets the uh, the qualified uh, qualified leads. All right. <laughs> Okay. Okay, we have a question here. Um, a guy says, if, um, "I'm not sure what your name is. Just called SB." Um, uh, asked about if you could tell us something about first party and third party cookies. Yes, definitely. We can cover that just a little bit. Um, also, um, so so from a a cookie and tracking perspective, it's a little bit. Uh, uh, different uh, uh, than than what we're actually talking about here. Then, if you if you take uh, Oracle for instance, uh, um, we have uh, our uh, Oracle partner, Oracle vendor, just just launched that they also have first party cookies, which means that you can actually track customers on mobile devices, and especially from uh, Safari and uh, the other uh, browsers that is automatically locking out, and more and more the browsers are are doing this, are locking out um, uh, cookie tracking. Uh, per default and by using first party cookies um, you can still track individuals like we're doing with the Elico platform and see what uh, uh, me specifically is um, is uh, focusing on. So I hope that's uh, just a, a quick question. I'd love to, to take a more detailed discussion on that. We had quite a lot of, uh, of uh, documentation on that also. Also we have a question here that says uh, what automation does is optimize the communication towards clients if used wisely, I think it's difficult to determine what the appropriate communication frequency is, especially now that customers demand more privacy. So where do you draw the line between what is reasonable, customer-friendly focused communication and spam? Yeah, that's a super uh, uh, super question, uh, Sonia, that you've, you've asked here. I think that's also, um, oh, it, it's, it's really difficult to, to give one simple answer to that because it, uh, it differs a lot from company to company, right? So um, I'm going to show you an example from one of our customers uh, in just a little while, which is uh, um, a big uh, gaming company. And you know that sort of uh, that sort of uh, a company that has a lot of transactions and interactions with the customers. You know they can send uh, emails every day to their customers without being associated with spam or you know stop sending information to me. So I think. The main thing that uh, the customers needs to be focusing on, on on that question, you know, when am I sending too much? It's really about understanding our buyers, right? It's really about being able to analyze uh, if my response rates and open rates are dropping. So maybe if you turn up the volume just a little bit and send out more uh, communication, then maybe you'll see your response rate starting to drop. Well, that's a clear indication that, they, oh, I'm sending too much right now. And actually, to be able to do that, you need to have uh, the right sort of solutions and uh, and technologies to 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 support that in uh, in real life. So I think uh, 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 a couple of our customers has actually um, uh, tested this and played around with this. And and what feedback they uh, is they're giving us is, you know, you can actually send much more than you think you could. So us as a uh, vendor that want to send out communication. Um, we tend to be a little bit too, um, what do you call that, too uh, um, scared of sending out more information, right? Oh, you cannot send more than one email a month. Well, do you actually know if that's true? Have you tried to send one every week? And that really comes down to the, the content you're sending out. Is that relevant and personalized, right? Um, so I hope that gives kind of a, a perspective on, uh, um, on that, Sonia. Um, <coughs> Sorry, guys. Um, let's go, let's get back to uh, to the next one, um, which is uh, all about the uh, big data, right? So, um, a lot of talk about the uh, big data. One second. Here we go. So, um, a lot of talk about the uh, big data, and as I said before, it's kind of the green IT of. Uh, of, uh, of these years, um, but just to give us a few uh, insights into what we see will be happening on on data in general, and if you just look at big data, and uh, you know we can find a lot of funny um, uh, numbers, and I just took up a few of them. So 
actually every minute 48 hours of video is being uploaded to YouTube. So we're generating 571 new websites every single minute. And also, I think this is one of the, the cool ones. 92% of all the data in the world was created within the last two years. And I think we can all agree that uh, it's not going to slow down, right? So data is really, really explosive. And I think from, from a marketing perspective, one of the issues here is that all of this data that's being generated how can we actually use this and how is this relevant for me as a as a modern marketeer now uh, if you look at this we, we can at a high level uh, categorize data into what i think is is two main uh, categories one would be transactional data which would be your purchase uh, uh, transactions uh, data in crm login data whatever it might be and then we have behavioral data which would be your website visit email response login history social data whatever it might be so those sort of uh, categories is is um, at least from from our perspective is uh, can data be uh, be categorized in, and if we look at this from uh, from, from as I said before from a marketing perspective, and we had an animation so I just stopped speaking. If you look at this from a, uh, from a marketing perspective, I think the biggest issue here is that it is completely um, uh, inaccessible for marketing to use any of this uh, information in the way it's uh, it's structured today. Now, most companies has a lot of different uh, databases. Uh, so you might have a CRM platform, you might have an ERP platform, you might have other databases where you have customer information, you have your email marketing platform where you have uh, subscriptions, and you have your website where you have hits on, a website hits on and tracking on, and you have your analytics. And you know, there's a ton of different places where we store data which is relevant for our customers. And if we bring all of this data into a centralized uh, platform like an automation platform, um, then we can suddenly start to use this for segmentation purposes and personalization and triggering campaign. And I think <coughs> and I think in, in the year of, uh, of 2014, um, I think what we will see on, on the big data is that marketing will start to understand the huge impact data can have on the performance that uh, that it is actually going to uh, to build for you guys um, and I think it, it's it, it really starts out by understanding the data you actually have in-house and how that should be structured so you can use it for segmentation purposes I think for for us um, in in particular and, and as, as you know we're, we're completely focused on marketing automation I think we see a lot of the projects that we're running right now where data and the, the, the concept of, of big data and using this for marketing purposes is a key element for, uh, for making decisions on, uh, on marketing automation. So understanding what data you as a potential customer actually have and how that can be aggregated into a, um, into a set of, of uh, uh, data that can be used from uh, from marketing perspective. As I said before, I'm going to sort of give you just an example of, uh, of uh, one of our customers uh, um, and, and just to give you some of the volumes of this uh, specific customer, they launched a new uh, uh, betting platform, um, and they went from 70 million actions, uh, you know, not only clicks but also a lot of other stuff, to 190 million actions in just 12 months. And it's a ton of data that's been generated, which is naturally not, you know, accessible for for the marketing department. So what they've done uh, actually some years ago is that they've uh, consolidated. Um, the data and aggregated the data into marketing relevant information. So they've created what they call active player days where um, you know, they monitor how many days have you played on a specific game within the last month, within the last week, etc. So not looking at the transactional data but looking at the aggregated data suddenly gives this customer a huge uh, potential in uh, doing segmentations based on anybody that's played uh, more than five times within the last week or within the last something. So that can now be categorized into maybe your high volume customer or low value customer or whatever it might be. Also they take uh, all of the transactions and calculate what would be the primary brand of this potential uh, of this uh, of this user of, of, of this customer's uh, brand. And to give you an example of how they actually use this from from within inside the Elico platform now they've made a uh, segment that says anybody that has the primary brand of casino, um, you know, they these are customers that play casino the most, which would be thirty thousand seven hundred eleven customers. And they've added up a segment that says 
okay, so out of these 30,000, how many of those have not logged in the last two weeks, right? So it ends up in 22,000, uh, 23,000 approximately uh, customers. And then also uh, adding up uh, customers that hasn't received any communication in the last two weeks. So they end up with about 15,000 contacts that uh, you know, mainly uh, are casino customers, um, online casino customers, uh, you know, that hasn't logged in for the last two weeks and hasn't received any communication either for the last two weeks. Now this is just one example of how big data could actually be used and as you can see just from this simple example it really generates a possibility to as a marketing department identify potential customers uh, you know, that would either, uh, either be a, a, in a phase of dropping out or you know, maybe we could get them to buy new stuff from us and this is just an example of one type of customer in the gaming industry but it could be any other B2C, B2B customers, right? So it could be customers that has uh, you know, maybe it is uh, you know, subscription based. So all customers that has subscription that's going to run out three months from now that has not responded to any of our communication for the last six months. So that might be customers that are in the risk of not renewing. So there's a ton of different ways where big data can uh, can be used, and this is some of the stuff that the uh, the Elko platform can also uh, also support. But it kind of starts with um, you know, marketing identifying. You know, transactional data is fine, but we can't really use that. So we need to aggregate it into elements like uh, like uh, active player days or primary brand in this case um, that we as a marketing department can uh, can use. I think we have a question. No, it was just uh, yeah okay. Um, Okay, two last things. We're just going to cover a little bit uh, shorter than the two first ones. Um, so, um, other one is uh, customer-centric communications, which kind of relates to the, the two first ones. And what we see happening in, in general is that, the, you know, I think everybody is aware of that, and there's no new thing in this, that, the, you know, this, the, the spray and pray or simple segmentation um, setup that, that a lot of customers are using today are not the most effective way of, uh, of communicating and we see a lot of customers that that has taken some sort of initiative to drive uh, you know, uh, personalized communication either on the website um, we have a, a cool product in our uh, portfolio called Monoloop which can do personalization on top of your existing CMS system um, and we see a lot of traction on that also also see a lot of customers that are either in the process or, uh, or are, you know, in the process of, of developing customer lifecycle program so the life cycle of my customer from being uh, you know prospect to being a potential customer to being a customer to um, you know having service and support and upsell and cross sell and renew and uh, the complete process of of a customer journey and having automated communication programs that are highly personalized um, is really um, really taking off also trigger based communication also one of the elements that uh, uh, very much in focus for the projects that that, that we're running, and by trigger-based communication, I mean uh, you know monitoring uh, individual customers' behavior on site, uh, sorry, online, uh, in a combination with uh, with uh, transactional data. So kind of like um, I showed you before with uh, customers that has not uh, bought product X uh, but are hitting our website, I want to automatically send them a a communication. And I think to be able to drive customer-centric uh, communication, um, we really need to go back to the uh, the element of of data, because as uh, you know, we we spoke about transactional and behavioral data, and these two elements are actually driving um, the ability to do personalization. So the relevance of the content that I'm sending is very much based on the transactional data. So what have you purchased earlier? You know, pre uh, a predictive analysis on if you've bought this or your subscription is dropping or your you know whatever it might be is changing from a purchase perspective then I want to send you relevant uh, relevant content and the timing aspect of uh, doing true personalization is very much based on the online behavior so if you suddenly start to interact on my website and my communication and joining webinars and other stuff well that indicates that you might be in the market and uh, you know, are moving in a buying process, which means that the timing for my communication is now being, uh, 
is now being more uh, more relevant. So I think from this simple model, it's it's really about how can we create relevance in content and in timing, and we need to go back to the two uh, parts of data being transactional data and online or behavioral data. So we see really a lot of customers working on customer-centric communication. So how can I drive uh, automated, uh, trigger-based, personalized communications? Um, and again, that, that kind of pushes the need for, uh, for data. The last element that I just want to cover also on, of the four uh, things that we really see happening in 2014 is uh, and we really see marketing automation taking off. Uh, we spent uh, five years on this uh, market so far and, and you know, from, I remember still from the beginning, uh, as I said, uh, when we, we started this uh, webinar, you know, when, when we said marketing automation to people, they were you know, looking kind of strangely at us and uh, was sorry the language, but what the hell are you talking about? Um, and today the market is so much more mature. There are so many projects that are actually either in uh, in in the prospecting phase or you know people are evaluating specific uh, specific vendors. Um, so I think 2014, 15, 16 really going to be uh, the years of uh, implementing uh, marketing automation. So I think a lot of customers will implement uh, this year. Uh, a lot of customers will buy into the vision of uh, marketing automation. But I think also, and this is just to be brutally honest, I think also, yeah, un un unfortunately, a lot of the customers that's going to implement um, also is a, in a big risk of, of failing. Um, just because, you know, the software can do uh, a lot of interesting stuff, but you can't fix anything by buying a new software and continuously doing uh, the same communication as you have done always. And I think history tells us that... Uh, and experience tells us that the customers that are really focused on the processes, the change management, the competences you need to have in the marketing department, the contact strategy you need to have in place, you know, the content marketing you need to have in place, integration of platforms and the quality of data, etc. The companies that are really focused on this, those are the ones that's going to um, achieve the fantastic potential that actually are in, in marketing automation. But I think it's it's so important for us, uh, and we say this all the time to to customers we um, uh, we engage with, either in in prospecting phases or or you know, in implementation phase. It's so important that you don't go out and buy a software of any vendor from us or any other uh, platform and think that it's gonna you know change the perspective of marketing. It's a completely set of uh, different uh, tactics that needs to be involved. A lot of the customers that are highly successful with this, um, they they bring in other sorts of people to the marketing department that they have not had before. Um, BI for data in the uh, data resources and, and, and those sort of um, um, information. So I think a lot of customers got to implement in 2014 and naturally the ones that uh, that we will do implementations for will not fall into the category of, uh, of failing because we know how much it takes to uh, to gain value out of this. Um, so, so I think the the customers that, that, that there there are vendors on this market that will tell you a story of uh, well, it's easy to implement and you can quickly uh, uh, you know get this platform up and running. And I can tell you the same. We can easily implement Eloqua and get this up and running. I just know from experience that if you really want to change this uh, the way you drive marketing, well, it's going to take a lot more content. It's going to take a new content strategy. It's going to take a change management process. It's going to take resources for you to align with sales and marketing. Um, and um, uh, there's a question here, uh, Mikhail uh, is asking, so it sounds like a lot of work for a smaller company. Yeah, and I, and I, I would tend to agree. Also, one of the questions that were raised uh, when you guys uh, joined the webinar, um, that if you really want to bring value to this, um, you have to invest resources in it. Um, but I, I can also promise you, if you invest resources in this, um, uh, you can uh, you can really really change uh, the numbers that you're generating from from a revenue perspective. So look at the amount of money you could save from uh, from the sales uh, sales squad. You know, just just from a cost of sales perspective, there's so much money to be saved. Um, so I think I think uh, as I also as I said before, there there are two sort of uh, vendors in this market. You know, there's there's the email service providers that does a little bit of automation. Um, and if so, if you want to 
implement a solution and 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 you think for your company it's enough to um you know to get an, an email marketing platform that can do a little bit more a little bit of social uh, can do a little bit of nurturing so you know i can send out an email and automatically send a reminder and those sort of things i think it's fine with an email uh, service provider i think that's the right choice but if if you are a, a company that believes in um, you know, in, in really changing this, the way we drive sales and marketing and see that your customers are buying differently. If you have a perspective of sales and marketing in my company must be able to be more effective. Then I think you need to, to, uh, to, to have a chat with the board of directors and the CEO and the VP of sales and try to identify whether, you know, maybe you're one resource in the, uh, in the marketing department. Maybe you should actually be two or three and they should be, uh, one or two uh, resources less in the sales department because if you make that investment I promise you there are so much value to be gained in this and we have uh, cases uh, uh, backing uh, backing this up also customers that drive this um, really change the way they uh, they move actually uh, I actually have a report from uh, eloquent that they have uh, monitored the 500 uh, uh, biggest companies uh, uh, I think it's from I think actually from the standard and poor's uh, index and <laughs> sorry guys uh, from the standard and poor's index where they've monitored the biggest uh, of the customers and and, and you know, the ones that are growing their revenue the most those are the ones that are working with marketing automation platforms and this is not something i'm making up we have this uh, uh, documented in a, in a report it's just an analysis they've done on, you know, who has the biggest growth rates and how do they drive sales and marketing. And the ones that has the biggest growth rates, those are the ones that are working with marketing automation in, in a sense of not just doing a standard email marketing in a new, new platform. So I hope that kind of answers your, your question, Michael, and maybe also uh, some, uh, some of the other questions that have been uh, raised. So just to sum up, I think from, from us, as I, as I said before, we see three, uh, sorry, four main, main tendencies. Roles of uh, sales and marketing uh, will start to change in, in 2014 uh, and maybe not uh, physically changing around, but from the plan of 2015, I think that's, that's where we're going to see some of the big changes. I think big data is really going to um, you know, start to um, evolve also this year. Uh, Customer-centric communication, I think that's definitely uh, a given. A lot of customers are, are in this arena already, and this need uh, drives the need for uh, big data and it, it really drives the need for implementation of marketing automation also and um, I know from ourselves that uh, you know, we, we've uh, we've grown quite rapidly the last uh, six months and are hiring people uh, more or less all the time so if any of you that uh, that's on the call has a, a good candidates or anything like that we're actually looking for people to uh, to support our, our new clients coming in um, so I think I think this arena is really gonna gonna develop, and it's driven by the consolidation from uh, the vendors. That many people now focusing on this market, communicating to customers, and an actual need with inside the customers. I think that's the the win-win uh, situation. So, from our perspective, I think these are the four main uh, topics. Um, and when I say from our perspective, uh, you know, from the marketing automation perspective, because marketing in general is also evolving, right, with social and everything. Um, and uh, I'm sure you can find a webinar that's going to tell you about uh, how social is going to develop uh, the, the coming years also. So this was, this was kind of the perspective of, of marketing automation. Um, a few uh, questions was uh, sent to us uh, prelim pre, uh, uh, preliminary the web uh, webinar, and we, we've promised naturally to, to cover this also. Uh, so one of the questions was, how do marketing automation as a blend uh, of online and offline so the way uh, automation solutions and at least the Eloqua platform works is that you can do all of your segmentations uh, inside the platform and then based on the profile of the customer you can decide whether this should be an offline communication an online communication should it be something that's pushed to through social or mobile so based on the channel you want to communicate through and uh, you can send a message to that and we have uh, actually uh, integrations with external vendors so the offline communication the direct mail piece you want to send out could automatically be sent to a printing supplier that sends out your communication so it could be for instance if somebody hits your website and uh, interacts with you at some level maybe you've uh, identified who this customer is through the automation technology 
and you automatically end up uh, in a campaign that says, okay, if you have given us permission, I'm going to send you this email, and you, if you haven't given us permission, I'm going to send you through, through to our printing supplier automatically, and they receive the list of the customers that should uh, receive the direct mail piece instead of the email. So that's sort of how uh, uh, offline also fits into uh, to automation. We have a lot of customers that use uh, the, uh, the segmentation engine of Eloqua to also segment for uh, offline purposes. Um, I hope that uh, answers that uh, question. Also, we have a question that says, how do you see the social media influence customer interactions in 2014? Now, I mean, you know, everybody knows that uh, that social is uh, is and will be a major part of uh, of uh, everything going forward, and that's not going to stop at all. So, I think it's really important again from a marketing automation perspective, but because I'm not going um, to tell you that I'm a social media expert. There are people that do nothing else but work with the social media. But I think from an, an automation perspective, what's evolving here is uh, is the ability to track. Um, the behavior um, on the social uh, arena also. So, for instance, with the Elico platform, we can actually track the individual and listen um, uh, in on what people are, you know, uh, tweeting and liking and, uh, uh, you know, sharing and uh, engaging in from a social perspective also, uh, which means that if you're active on a, on, a, on a group on Facebook, we can follow up on that with you interacted and, see which links you clicked on, kind of like what, uh, what you're able to do on websites. So build that 360 customer profile, not only from your own website, but also what customers are doing from a social perspective. Um, but I don't, think, I don't think that's the key thing that uh, is driving this market, to be honest. I think it's much more about the uh, data, uh, trigger-based communication, personalization, those sort of elements. So I think still social is a little bit... Uh, no, it's a little bit uh, blurry for a lot of customers, um, and we don't have a lot of cases where customers say, you know, social is the key element for us in, in choosing an automation solution. Last question uh, kind of relates to, um, uh, to, to a question we talked about before. Does the Eloqua solution scale down? Well, it, it, it kind of depends on what we mean with scale down. It, it, it's divided up into two different categories, and... Uh, uh, so it, it does scale down, uh, but I would say that uh, you know if you are a company with uh, uh, ten people, the Eloqua solution is not the right one for you. Um, so there there is uh, options of scaling it down, and uh, both from a price perspective and feature and functionality perspective. So that can definitely be done, and you can actually go to uh, to Eloqua's website, and you can see uh, on the products uh, there's there's a description of the um, the basic version of uh, Eloqua, what that includes, which is uh, a complete uh, uh, automation solution also. Um, let me just double check if we have had any other questions come in here. Um, <clears throat> Michael is also asking here, who should lead the process um, of the implementation, sales or marketing? Uh, I think actually marketing is, is, uh, is the only ones that actually can lead this, uh, this process. And the reason I'm saying this is because um, you know, sales are focused on reaching their numbers this month and the next month and this quarter, etc. And this is a process that needs to be driven not on the, on the short term, but on the long term, where we are patient enough to change the way we communicate, continuously build content, etc. Um, so I think the only place where this can be successful is if marketing is leading the process. Um, but it has to be in complete coordination and alignment with the sales department. Uh, because marketing can't change this uh, by themselves. Because sales will just run around talking about the, you know, the same stuff they've always done. So the, the the decision has to be a management CEO, VP of sales, VP of marketing uh, decision, and the process has to be led by marketing and more or less IT. Um, so I hope Michael that uh, that kind of answers your uh, question. I think that's uh, more or less what I wanted to uh, to cover unless we have um, other questions We're a little bit uh, over time uh, maybe that's because of my uh, coughing hope that wasn't too uh, too bothering um, only thing I just want to uh, uh, bring your attention to also is that we have a new webinar coming up uh, just remove that which is on the 19th of February um, where are we gonna do a uh, a kind of uh, 
back to basic what is marketing automation actually all about um, so we're going to take that from a personalization perspective and we're going to show you um, completely what automation is all about and how you can use it on a daily uh, basis and we actually plan on also try to show you um, how an automation platform works giving you examples of uh, our own re-engagement program our own uh, uh, introduction programs that uh, that we are, are running and this is on the 19th um, we're going to send out invitations for this um, I think it's uh, during the next couple of days um, okay uh, well I'm sorry so every time I scroll up and down you can't hear my sound so I'm just gonna uh, repeat what I just said so uh, new webinar 19th of February focused on marketing automation the basics we're going to show you how we do our own re-engagement campaigns um, how we gonna uh, how we do our own introduction campaigns and where to start when uh, when and if you want to look at the at marketing automation invitation is going to be sent out um, uh, during the next couple of uh, of days to all of you so if nothing else thank you all for uh, joining I hope uh, uh, this little little bit different webinar that we usually have has, uh, has been uh, beneficial for you all trying to give you a sense of where we see this market uh, going to so I uh, hope it's been uh, beneficial and uh, I'm gonna stay online a couple of minutes more so if you have any questions feel free to, uh, to just type it into the chat or else I'll uh, just uh, take this opportunity also to uh, wish you all a fantastic day thank you for uh, for now